Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for tuning in for another episode. I'm sitting out here in the garage, just got back to the house. I wanted to do a little bit of a recap for you regarding how the practice uh, occurred and how that led me to finding the winning fish in the tournament and then walk you through all the specific baits that I used. Really kept it, kept it pretty simple in, in the tournament, but in practice, I had probably 25 different rods out, really trying to unlock what that secret bait was gonna be. And I gotta tell you, it was pretty tough, guys. So as a little bit of a recap, you know, a lot of you know that I've got, I've got a lot of history on the Mississippi River, but not, I'm not a local by any means, meaning I've been fishing it probably for 15 years now, but it's generally like once, maybe twice a year. And it was really dictated by, by tournament schedule. Meaning, you know, if I was fishing a local circuit and we went there, then I went there for that tournament. Most of my experience is this time of year. So that is one positive thing. But what I quickly found out when I got there was that really high spring floods changed the river dramatically since the last time I was there two years ago. Last time I was there was the title championship, which was, uh, I think, in the end of August. So roughly the same time of year. It was summer fishing. And what I found was that those high spring floods, which then dropped to really low summer levels and have been stagnant at these summer levels for the last two months, led to a lot of changes in the river. So the first day of practice, I decided to go down to Pool 9. Pool 9 is very much a river, but then off of the river are a bunch of little chutes, and those chutes feed major backwater complexes. And the backwater complex that I really liked the fish the most uh, had every one of those feeder chutes completely blocked off by sandbars that were new. You know, they were high and dry sandbars. So the high spring water created a sandbar in the front of these ditches that feed the backwaters. The low water then dropped to a point where it was below the sand. So there was literally no current flow making its way into the majority of the backwater systems. What I found was that a good portion of the fish either moved out to the main channel where they still had some current flow or they stuck back in those backwaters. But because there was no current flow to position them in the backwaters, they generally just became free swimming fish. So I could catch a bunch of fish if I just picked up a swim jig or a chatterbait and went down the bank, but there was no rhyme or reason to the bites that I was getting. Some were related to the edges of eelgrass, some were relating to uh, old sandbars that really had no current flow over them, but most of the fish were just scattered around, some sitting far off the bank and some were sitting right on the bank. So I caught a bunch of largemouth doing that, I just had no size. I think I had one or two keepers. I would say I probably had to catch five short fish to catch a keeper, and the keepers were 15 inches, not the right quality fish for the river. And keep in mind, I was going there with the mindset that I knew I needed a top 78 finish to guarantee myself into the BPT. So I needed, I needed 11 plus pounds a day, and catching 15 inches wasn't gonna do it. Now I will say, after exploring that, I moved out to the main river channel, and I got on some really good smallmouth. Uh, I had several areas where they would come up schooling and there were a lot of two and a half plus pound smallmouth up to, you know, I think I had one that was probably three and a half. Now, I didn't catch many of them, but I was throwing a topwater bait, uh, specifically this big bone colored vixen. Uh, and I was, I had the hooks rolled over on it. I had some bad hooks that I rolled over and this led to me getting a whole pile of bites. I really did have a lot of action on it. Uh, the problem that I had, well, there were two problems. One, I was chasing smallmouth, and smallmouth on the river are here today, gone tomorrow, meaning it's not, it, a lot of it is timing. So if you pull up in the right spot, you could catch five fish for 12 pounds pretty easily. But you also were not necessarily guaranteed you were gonna run into those fish throughout the course of a tournament day. And if you're running to pool nine, you're gonna fish for maybe six hours max, because it's about a half hour, uh, it's about an hour each way with the run to get there and to get through the lock. You gotta give yourselves at least, you're losing at least two hours of time. 
And then depending how far you run, you know, on pool nine, you can run another like 35 miles or something like that. So you could potentially be running about 60 miles from takeoff with a lock in the middle. That's a lot of time you're giving up. So that was one issue was chasing smallmouth. The other was there were a handful of guys down there. And most of these guys I actually talked to quite a bit. So one of the guys was Matt Reed. One of the guys was Kyle Cordiana. And we were bouncing information off each other. And they found the same, I don't know if it was the same groups of fish, but they were doing the same thing. And there's not that much of it on pool nine to the point where in the, you know, in the top half of the pool, I pretty much covered that all in a less than a half a day of fishing. So I didn't feel good that if there were a bunch of guys going down there, that you would be guaranteed to get on a spot that you wanted. And the last thing I wanted to do was run down there and get on a spot or, or not be able to get on a spot. And then I had really no backup. Now I did have the first day of practice. I did find one little area in a backwater that was full of eelgrass, really clear water, lots of little holes in the eelgrass. And I was throwing a swim jig covering water and I couldn't, I didn't get bit really by those fish. I was getting a lot of pike bites, but I started drifting over these big holes and I could see bass in the holes, but they were ignoring my swim jig. So after the first two or three holes of seeing fish with no bites, the next hole I came to, I threw a five inch Berkeley uh, Maxent Wacky Rigs, uh, the general, uh, I think that one was a purple one that I threw, but I threw it in the hole and got a bite. Now those fish were mostly two pound fish. I did see a couple that maybe were two and a half, two and three quarter. Uh, but what that did was that, that gave me confidence that, Hey, these fish have been pressured really hard over the last three weeks. The first, you know, the first group of fish I came to with the, with the wacky rig, I got bit. Whereas the fish, the first couple holes before that they were ignoring the swim jig. So I didn't feel good that they were really eating moving baits well, but it gave me the confidence to throw that wacky rig. So that was my day in pool nine. I had mostly smallmouth and one area that had five or six holes in it. And there were a keeper largemouth sitting in each. So I felt like I could fall back maybe on those largemouth, but those were for keeper sized fish. They weren't going to do me much good other than maybe filling a limit. Uh, day two of practice, because I didn't want to commit fully to nine, I went to pool eight. Pool eight is my favorite pool. I've got the most experience out there. And man, it was getting pounded by anglers. And, you know, the, the main channel was definitely getting hit hard because, again, a lot of the fish had pulled out to the main channel. My primary areas out there were not good. Uh, I really struggled to get bit. Now I will say in one area, in the Stoddard area, I was able to get a couple of bites again on a swim jig and a chatterbait uh, and a wacky rig, but it wasn't, it wasn't good enough for me to feel confident about it. Um, so much so that I was getting ready to lock up, or not lock, but trailer up to pool seven at the end of day two of practice, but we had a major storm blow through. So I actually ended up getting off the water around 530 because we had storms couple of sets of storms over the next couple hours. Um, so at, going into day three, I was like, you know what? I, I'm not, I, I know I can go to nine and catch some fish if I can get on those spots. I didn't want to go back down there and just continue to find more spots for smallmouth because I just felt like I, I didn't want to target smallmouth. That's generally not the winning pattern out there. So I decided to go up to pool seven. Uh, pool seven's a pool that I, I've got history on, but I've never really gotten on them good on Lake Onalaska. But I decided to go to pool, to Lake Onalaska, uh, looking for two things. I really thought I could potentially get onto an eelgrass bite because I figured with the low water that some of those fish would be really concentrating on the lake, especially since there was no current really to pull them up into the chutes and you know, they, they either had to be in the lake or they had to go to the main river. And I've got a lot of decent areas and chutes that kind of connect Lake Onalaska to the river. And I tried those with no success at all. So that really led me to believe they're either on the main river or they're on Lake Onalaska. So I went and I decided I would commit the, the, a good chunk of that first day to Lake Onalaska. And I found two things. I found one group of, of schooling fish that I feel like everyone who was there on day three found. Uh, and then I found one stretch of grass where I caught uh, two fish 
going down it. Uh, I had one on the swim jig. It was like a two and three quarter. And then I decided to throw the wacky rig in a couple of holes. And I caught one that was probably like two and a quarter. And at that point I was like, okay, well the stretch has some fish. And then I, I just did put the wacky rig in my hand without a hook on it and shook off probably four or five more bites. But it was over a, a long area, probably like a half mile long area. So I, again, I wasn't sold on it, but I was like, okay, I can get some bites. The second, well, I'd say the last four hours, I went out to the main channel of Pool 7, fishing wing dams, island heads, current seams, doing classic river stuff. And I found a couple of spots that uh, had some had some small mouth on it. I had one really big large mouth that blew up on that vixen three or four times. Uh, I mean, right next to the boat, he just wouldn't leave it alone. It was probably a four pounder. So I felt like pool seven going into the tournament, even though I wasn't sold on the grass, I did have a grass stretch that had some bites. Uh, there were some schooling fish that I had found, even though I didn't know if they'd be there or if I could get on them. And then I had some some main river stuff. So I kind of felt like Pool 7 had the best of both worlds. Small mouth, large mouth versus Pool 8, which I completely wrote off. And then Pool 9, which was mostly just small mouth. So come tournament time, I decided to go up to Pool 7. And uh, all, all three days, basically, we had locking issues in the morning. There were barges in the lock. So we didn't get up to pool seven, I don't think, until close to nine o'clock the first day. And I went uh, right to the stretch where I had the, the grass bites and fished for like probably 45 minutes without a bite. But then I hit a stretch where, you know, I caught them pretty consistently. It was never, I never had a cast. Like I never got had a cast where I caught one. I think over the whole course of the time, I think I caught two fish when I had the power poles down at the same time, meaning I caught one, power poles were down, cast around, and then caught another. It was generally, they were every like 20 minutes apart, but I did hit a stretch where, you know, I caught, I, 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 I think I caught seven fish, you know, from, a, I'm gonna say about 10, probably about 10, 15 till noon. And uh, one of those was a five and a quarter, and then the others, I think I had a couple of three pounders and a couple of two and a halfs. I ended up having 16 and a half pounds. And on that day, I was done by noon, had to go back and lock through because there were barges coming through. Went down to pool eight, never caught anything more. I was in fourth place. Uh, day three or day two, which I don't have any footage for guys. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, I thought the camera was running. It wasn't. We had a bunch of rain. It just never, I, I just totally didn't realize it wasn't on. So that didn't work. The good thing is I had a live camera all three days. So if you watch live, you can see the fish catches that I had. But day, so day two, again, we had a lock or a barge in the lock. We didn't get up there until I think it was a little after eight. So a little bit earlier. Because of that, I actually went to the schooling fish first because I thought if I can catch some schooling fish, I might be able to do that a lot faster than getting on that grass flat. Because because what I had found in practice in the tournament was where I had bites in practice didn't mean that's where I was going to get bites. The first day of the tournament, every fish I caught was was in stretches between where I had bites. So what that told me is those fish were roaming that area. Uh, and because of that, I didn't really just want to start and go fishing. I thought maybe if I started in the schooling fish, I could get a couple of fish quicker. Well, I went there, I sat there for probably 20 minutes, never saw a fish bust, never saw anything happen. At that point, I went back to my grass line, at which point the wind really started ripping, a big storm blew through, and it was pretty much unfishable for what I was looking at doing. So I ended up packing up and running to a couple of other areas on the main river, as well as some backwaters, just trying to put some fish in the boat during the storm. Cause I knew the storm was gonna pass by about 10 and get sunny and flat again. That's what the weather was calling for. So I ended up uh, going out to the main river channel and I did put a couple of fish in the boat. Uh, I had one, so in a backwater, I had one line burner largemouth that I caught on a wacky rig, a little current spot. And then I went out to the main channel and I could not get them to hit the top water, but I was catching them really good on uh, a little 3.3 Kitek with a 3.16 ounce tush. 
so I ended up catching one keeper smallmouth on this. I had one, I'm going to say like a two and a half pounder. It didn't cost me at, at all, but he hit it and he, he hit it and ran right at the boat, came up, jumped like three feet. And I never got a hook set. I mean, I set the hook and I like whipped on him. That's how fast he was hitting it. But I caught probably 10, 10 smallmouth on the tush, just swimming it over the, the tops of wing dams. And I could not get them to come up. But I will say, after I got them going on this, uh, and I was catching them every other cast, but they were all little 12-inch fish, I did then, at that point, pick up the Vixen and threw it up there, and I did trigger a key 3.5-pound smallmouth to hit that right next to the boat, put him in the boat. That gave me three fish uh, on day two, at which point the storm was about over, so I ran back to the grass flat, and it was still blowing pretty good. And when it was overcast and windy, I couldn't see the grass lines. I really needed to see the grass lines. And there was one little patch of grass out from the grass line I was fishing. So for whatever reason, I picked up the spook and threw, threw one or two casts out there and ended up catching a three and a quarter pound largemouth. So that gave me four fish and I really started settling down. Even though two of them were straight line burners, uh, I just picked up again the Maxent General and Green Pumpkin, black and blue, black and blue with a blue tip, or uh, even the purple color. And from that standpoint, I just, you know, slowly picked apart the area. Ended up catching my fifth fish, and then I caught two more, like three pound class fish to call out the two line burners. And at that point, I, th I had another six, I think I would 16 six, which are really good bags on the Mississippi River. And there was basically noon again, so we loaded up. There was barge coming, locked down. I went down to pool eight and ended up having, I think I caught four more small keepers, but nothing that helped me. And that was it. So I was sitting in second place now. Um, Steve Lopez was still leading by about 12 or 14 ounces. Fishing, uh, which I didn't know this, but he was fishing almost identical to me. Uh, he was... I think he was further north in Lake Alaska. I don't know exactly where it was. I'd, I'd love to hear from him to find out roughly what part of the lake he was in, but I think he was north of me. Um, anyway, so the point being, he was fishing very similar, throwing a wacky rig on eelgrass lines. The, the problem with day three is we had a double-decker barge that got in the lock. That ended up costing us, again, a couple hours. I ran right up to my eelgrass line, and I and they didn't show this on live. I don't know why, but I mean, within minutes of pulling up, I caught a 311, and then the only time the whole time where I had my pole, power poles down and ended up making another cast, I think it was my next cast, or maybe the second to next cast, I caught one that was like a 3-2. So I had two really nice fish in the boat right off the bat. But then I went like an hour and a half without a bite. Uh, I had worked my way all through most of my dots, got to the northernmost portion, at which point I found them again. And I, I ended up catching my limit uh, pretty quickly. But, you know, it was I think it was right around noon when I finally caught my limit. And again, they were all pretty decent fish. When I put them on the scales, uh, I had 14 something. And then I ended up catching another one just short of three pounds uh, right around 1230 and that cold one out and bumped me up to 15 and a half pounds. And at that point, uh, I saw some guys running by me going back towards the lock, like three or four guys, which had me really questioning what was going on because I was looking at my app and the app did not indicate that there was any barge traffic coming. But I decided I'd run down to the point where I could check it out because it really wasn't that far maybe, you know, five minute run. So I ran down there and sure enough, they were tying up the first part of a double decker barge. The same barge that locked us out in the morning was now coming back. And at that point, that's when things started to get a little hairy because it was about one o'clock when I ran down there or when I finally got down there. And then at that point, uh, you know, I actually went back and fished for another 15 minutes in an area I had no luck in practice, but I wanted to be within sight of the barge. And as we got closer, every, you know, we all just like stopped fishing because we recognized that there was another barge coming down the river. And if we got an opportunity to lock, you had to be there because if you didn't get in that lock, that other barge would be there. So we all ended up just congregating back at the bar at the lock. 
Uh, at which point, you know, I was there and then Steve showed up and Steve came and asked me and he said, did you, did you, you know, what'd you get? And I told him I had what my Bubba scale said was 15.3. I ended up weighing 15.8. That was the only time the Bubba scales were off, but it was off in my favor a little bit. And, you know, he, he, you know, at that point said he had 13 and a half and his scale had been weighing light. So he probably had close to 14. So I, I had, there was, it was like, you know, there's a little bit of excitement there knowing that I have a potential to win the tournament. It doesn't mean that somebody else didn't catch him, but at the same time, it ramped up my level of anxiety knowing that we were locked out at the moment. And we bummed around. We had to be in at 2.30 and at 2, uh, at, at two o'clock, Tom Monsoor came over to me and he goes, Matt, I've, I made some calls. I think we're going to get through. I think we're going to get your fish in to weigh in and you might get your win. And uh, he, you know, again, I don't know exactly who he called or what, you know, he, he's a kill him with kindness type of guy. So maybe it was just the lock master. Maybe he called four lock masters. I don't really know. The point is he, uh, he's a special man and made, you know, made something out of nothing and got those barge operators moving. Like you could, you could see them moving slow earlier to like hustling to get out of there to help us get in there. And then the lock, once we got in, it was a couple minutes. It was like 206, 207. And normally the lock cycle takes 15 to 20 minutes, but the lock masters really got us in, lined up, dropped the water, opened the doors, let us go. And, uh, you know, we were able to make it back with what feels like an eternity. I mean, I think I actually got back with like seven and a half minutes to go. But the reality is that was way, way closer than I ever would have thought. And had we had a normal lock cycle, it would have been extremely close. Um, so it ended up working out in my favor, obviously. Big shout out to all the other guys going up to Pool 7 uh, to see what, you know, myself and Steve Lopez and Tom Mansour and Nick Trim and Jared Lintner. I mean, I think we were the top five out of the six guys and we did it in three hours of fishing each day like to me that is ridiculous the weights we brought in was crazy and it shows probably how good lake on alaska was fishing but i gotta tell you there were a lot of guys up there on days one specifically day two as well that did not catch them so it wasn't like you just had to show up you really had to know what you were looking for when you got there to make your three to three and a half hours of fishing time last. So from a, a rod and reel standpoint, like I said, I mean, the, the key bait right here, 13 of the 15 weigh-in fish was caught on a Berkeley Max Scent, the general five inch, I wacky rigged it. I did do some various tricks with it. I'm gonna talk about that in another video for you, just to keep this one from being too long, but I fished it not weedless. It's just on a wide gap uh, finesse hook. I had 10 pound Berkeley 100% fluorocarbon, toughest fluorocarbon line out there. To be honest with you, those fish, I just let the fish cut through the eelgrass on their own, tied to 10 pound Berkeley X9 braided line. Uh, I used a relatively short leader for me. It was probably, in, uh, I'm gonna say about an eight footer is what I started with. And that was just cause I was fishing only three foot of water. And I, I figured I was better off with more braid than fluorocarbon and there was no reason to have longer fluorocarbon. Uh, I, so I did, I fished this, and one of the keys this week was the rod. So this is, again, a custom-built rod. It's the MHX NSJ872. So it's a 7.3, I'm going to say a light medium action. It's not a full-blown medium, but it's definitely not a medium, uh, a, a medium light. It is definitely more of a lighter medium side, but fast action rod. Enough backbone to set the hook from a long distance and keep the pressure on the fish, because I really didn't horse them i just kept pressure and they would swim through the grass you guys have heard me talking about that before i never lost a fish all week uh i did have one where i set the hook and it like it stuck for a second and pulled out don't know what it was i actually think it was a pike because the line came back kind of frayed but i i never lost a fish all week and i think that the rod uh was a huge part to that and that was the main workhorse now two of my other weight fish like i mentioned uh, and then I guess from a real standpoint, this is a discontinued Abu Garcia MG Extreme. Uh, it's like a top of the line Abu Garcia reel that they've replaced, replaced with the Xenon series, which I'm sure would have worked fine as well. 
Uh, that's just when I've got great equipment that lasts, there's no reason for me to get rid of it. Uh, the two other weigh-in fish that I had, both three and a half pound class, three and a quarter, three and a half pound class fish, a small mouth, the only small mouth I weighed, plus one large mouth on a Reaction Innovations Vixen. Uh, I did add a treble hook with some flashaboo on it. Uh, that's a little thing I like to do, not stock on the bait. I fished this on a uh, 14 pound Berkeley XL green line. This is a MG... Uh, this is a Abu Garcia MGX reel, um, a great reel. Again, this has been discontinued as well, but it's a, a great, that's an 8.0 to one speed, I believe. And then I fished this on my favorite topwater rod. You can see this one's been abused. The wind grips are starting to wear out a little bit. This is one of the first rods I think I ever built. Uh, it's an, uh, this is the MB843. So it's a seven foot, three power, fast action rod. Love it for top waters. This thing has been with me through a lot of wars and will continue to be. But those were the two main rods uh, setups. I did mention I did have uh, some fish in the box on day two that I had on a core tackle 316th tush with a 3-3 Kitek. This is the sexy shad color. Fish this on 15 uh, uh, 12 pound fluorocarbon, Berkeley 100% fluorocarbon on an NMB 873 MHX blank that I built. And again, this is the same Abby Garcia uh, MGX reel that is again discontinued. It just happened to be the rods that I grabbed to put those baits on. You know, I did, if you watched live, you probably saw me make a few extra casts throughout the day. I did have a light Texas rig pit boss. Uh, this is just something if I came to clumps of eelgrass or a piece of wood, I would, I would plop this in there. Never caught anything on it, which really surprised me, uh, but I did have that. I also had a heavier Creature Hog, a Max Scent Creature Hog paired up uh, with a uh, 5 8 ounce weight for, again, pitching into some of that thicker grass. If there were clumps that were so thick, I couldn't get that light Texas rig through it. Uh, I did bounce around a frog a little bit. Never had a frog bite all week, and then I also had a a swim jig with a uh, grass pig, a Berkeley grass pig on the back. That was geared up and I threw that kind of in between areas. But I, you know, I had those rods on the deck with me, didn't produce anything. The only three rods that produced were the, the Tush, the Maxent General, and the Vixen. So that was it. Kept it pretty uh, simple and straightforward. It worked out just fine. I still can't believe that the area that I ended up going to turned into a winning area. A lot of times people say, you don't expect the wins when they happen. Well, this was one where I very, very, uh, I was very close to going to pool nine because I didn't think the grass area I had was anything special. And it turned into the winning area. So uh, that's where we're at, guys. I kind of wish the season wasn't ending. I really feel like I'm fishing good. And I, I give a lot of credit to you guys out there. Uh, and that's specifically because I feel like I'm making daily videos. I'm just really submerged in the fishing industry. And it just has me thinking the right way and thinking about presentations and how baits work and what baits to use. And, uh, you know, it's your support out there that motivates me to continue making videos. So me making videos and being out on the water some, even though I haven't done many on the water videos recently because I haven't been home, um, I give a lot of credit to you guys. I really do feel like this is a team, a team victory for us. Uh, so hopefully it opens the floodgates. Hopefully there's a lot more for us to come. Qualified for BPT, quali qualified for Red Crest. Who knows what else we're going to fish next year, but I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all the kind words. Uh, it's been, I've been overwhelmed with the support I've gotten from the fishing community. It's been absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah, it hasn't really stopped. I'm still at a few days later and I am exhausted. I got to tell you, I'm mentally exhausted from this week, but it's been phenomenal. So thanks guys. Stay tuned. We'll have a new video coming out tomorrow. We'll probably be back to tips and tricks, although I could feel like I could talk about a win for weeks. All right, I'm out of here.